Spoiler Country. All right, guys, welcome back to Spoiler Country. Today's episode is well, it's one in a million, isn't it? We really? have. I mean, this guy is a class act, and I guarantee you know exactly who he is when you see him. And you know what, Johnny? We didn't even bother doing an introduction. I told him, I said, everybody's going to know who you are. I'm not even going to bother. And he's like, oh, good, great, which he appreciates, nice. you know, because all that stuff can come, can sound condescending, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's the one and only Thomas Jane, isn't it? It is, man, dude. He is He is such a good actor. I don't have yeah. his for a long time. Yeah. I was very sad that I couldn't join you. Yeah, it's it was cool talking with them. He is definitely a down to earth person. The one thing you're gonna find, so we just so people know, we didn't talk about a lot of stuff. We didn't talk about Punisher because he's like, there's a thousand interviews of me do, doing Punisher, you know, and he doesn't do. I shouldn't say a thousand. Oh, yeah. He doesn't do a lot of interviews. He's not an interview guy. He doesn't like doing interviews. So why he came on our show, we'll never know. But we'll really, really appreciate it. <laughs> but. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just done doing talking about Punisher and all that kind of stuff. Cause he's, you know, he's already done it. So, and that's fine. And he, but he gave us the quintessential, I think he gave us the greatest snapshot Punisher clip that you could ever have in dirty laundry. And if you haven't watched dirty laundry, I implore you to go out to YouTube and just look up Punisher dirty laundry and watch oh. it. it. It really is probably the best representation of who the Punisher is. Oh yeah. It's, it's amazing. So I love that short clip, man. It's so good. Yeah, you're the one who turned me on to it. I didn't even know it was out there until like four years ago when you said, have you seen this? And I'm like, no. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. The one thing you're going to find in this interview, Johnny, is that he is a massive comic book fan. And oh, right nice. now, it seems like the in vogue for these Hollywood types to come in and do comic books. But this isn't his first comic. He, he's he's putting out one called Lycan. Yeah. With Aftershock and his own production company, Renegade. They're oh, nice. up to do this and they're looking for artists now. So if you are an artist and he wants somebody who does Bernie Wrights in style or even uh, more realistic, go on Twitter and you can do at Thomas Jane and you can tell him, you can show him your stuff because he really wants to find the right artist for it. And, but dude, he gets in, he shows me some of the stuff that he has hanging on, on his wall near his kitchen. And it's all a these amazing covers. And he's huge on the horror comics. He loves it. He was personal friends with Bernie Wrightson for many years. So Bernie would come to his house and they would hang out and do stuff. Or he'd go to Bernie's studio and he, he talked about how what Bernie's studio looked like <laughs> and everything. I, I was floored of how much knowledge in comic books that he had. That he That's has, so cool. Yeah, he has a real love for the medium. And yeah, and this isn't his first. He did Badlands with Steve Niles with his first production company he created called Raw. And he goes, yeah, I read it. He was talking about reading it. And he goes, he went back and read it a couple months ago. And he goes, it's so bad, you know, the writing. <laughs> he said, the art looks fantastic, but the writing is so bad because it was him. He was, you know, he was learning how to do it. And yeah. he's more into directing. He's directed quite a few actual movies now, but that's what he wants to do more behind the camera than in front. But he'll do that nice. in front. The other thing is cool with Tom is that I call him Tom now. Just, you know. You guys are tight. <laughs> We're tight like that. Yeah. No, but the, <laughs> seriously, the other cool thing is you're going to find out this guy is extremely honest. If he worked on a movie and he thinks it's bad, he says it. It's, no, yeah. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yep. He told me because he. I told him, I said, I want to go watch this tonight because I just saw the preview for it. He's like, nah, don't waste your time with that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I'll let you guys see, hear it and figure out which one we're talking about because, uh, yeah, it was really funny. Yeah, this is legit one of the ones I was sad that I couldn't be on. I mean, I really want – well, as soon as this one came in, I'm like, I want to be on that one. Yeah. But I'm on vacation with my family in California right now, and there's no – I mean, I, I barely have enough cell service to make this call with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's cool. You know who else is coming on, though? Hmm. And might as well drop it now is Leah Thompson's coming on. Really? Yep. So I didn't know about that one. She just confirmed today. So that's another cool thing that we have going on. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this and keep an eye out for Leah Thompson coming on because we're going to talk about a whole lot of stuff because that lady's in a ton of amazing movies. Dude, she's amazing. Yep. And hopefully you guys are going to, I think this is, so if you listen to this interview with Tom J Thomas Jane, it's either you're going to love him or you're not. You know what I mean? Because he is. Yeah super honest super just like says what's on his mind and yeah we almost got in trouble together 
talking about things that might have been bad to put out. So, you know. Nice. Yeah. Can't wait to hear that on the yeah. backside. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I asked him the question, when is nudity and sex appropriate in the movies? Because right. it seems like it's too much, you know, right now. And he goes, as soon as you're done filming, then it's, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but he, you, you know, he's, he's like, it's just Americans have a very repressed situation yeah, for sure. with for it. Sure. And, and he goes into that and it's, yeah, it was a wonderful conversation. It really was. Nice. I'm, so, I'm excited for this one, man. I'm super excited to hear this one. Yeah. So just so people know, Lycan is coming out from Aftershock and his and co-produced with his company, Renegade. If you're an artist and you can hit those realism kind of notes and have that Bernie rights and feel reach out, show them your work. Cause you never know what yeah. might, might happen. Do it. There you go. And tell them we sent you there. Yeah. Tell them, <laughs> tell them we sent you, tell them your good buddies. Of Spoiler country sent us here. Right. <laughs> your good friends. <laughs> Best of pals. <laughs> Dude, he, you know, the one thing he was talking about, he, he got to go to this gallery and it was all original Bernie or not Bernie Jack Kirby's. And oh, nice. Like his, all his original stuff all put out in this thing. And he goes, man, you start walking through and he's a huge Kirby fan. And he's like, I'm like, yeah, it's the hands for me when it comes to Kirby. Yeah. The Kirby hands. Are- yeah. The Kirby hands. He's like, Oh God, the hands are so good. And then we started talking about and, and kind of giving things away, but this, it's okay because it, it all comes fluid. Uh, Frank Darabont. Yeah owns almost every single original drawings of the Franken Bernie Wrights and Frankenstein run. Oh Jesus. I know that's right? awesome. That's gotta be just I mean just flip I mean, imagine, imagine how you, you I only read the comic book with the original art. Right. <laughs> right. Well you know the Frankenstein trading card set that that writes and did is kind of his magnus opus, right? Oh it's it's amazing. Yeah. And he and and Tom he, he was like yeah dude he knew it when he was when he was drawing it that this was a yeah. pinnacle that's why it took have, so long for him to finish. I have a card from that set signed by him. Oh no way! Yeah. yeah, never. Oh my god, dude, where is it? It's in my. It's at home. And, well, oh, I, I, I mean, dud. Like what? You gonna put it in your wallet and walk around <laughs> with it? <laughs> you yeah. never said that you had that. I always forget about it because it's what it's my trading card collection, which, which I never look at. You know. Oh man, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, there you I also go. Have a copy, I have a copy of Batman the Cult he did signed by Bernie Wrightson, too. Uh, my favorite artist of all time. I never got a chance to meet him. I never got anything. Uh, and it he's so over. influential, man. He's so yeah. good. Yeah. There you guys go. Let's do it. Sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy this interview with, fuck, man, the Thomas Jane. <laughs> one and only. The one and only. <laughs> Spaghetti. I love that you got a pipe, dude. I, I, I keep wanting to try. I, I, I'll smoke a good cigar every once in a while. Yeah. yeah. I was in the cigars, and then I directed an episode of The Expanse. had a blast. Yeah. And last year. And, and figured the pipe might make me look like I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> we had Larry Hankin on. Do you know Larry Hankin? Uh-uh. He's a character. He, he does a lot of stuff, but he was on the, uh, the Escape from Alcatraz with Clint Eastwood. Oh, he, shit. The, He's the guy that gets left behind uh-huh. and he's, and he's got to cry and he has his whole thing. And he talks about one of the scenes in the hospital yes. that was Clint's like first time actually directing. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. it wasn't his first time, but, but he, he did play Misty for me, but uh, yeah, but, he, yeah. He, he, but he was learning. So the guy that, that, Oh God, what is the guy's name that directed escape from Alcatraz escape from Alcatraz? He, Oh, good question. I saw that movie in the theater and everybody was complaining how quiet it was. Oh, really? Yeah, it was really interesting, you know, because there's a lot of silent sequences in the movie, but but the sound itself was mixed in this very kind of low way and everybody in the theater was was complaining. I remember that. Don Siegel was the director. Oh, shit. I I was going to say Don Siegel. Yeah, and that guy did a ton of stuff. He even worked on Casablanca and just... That's his mentor, you know? Yeah, that's his mentor. So... Larry's talking about he came in and and when he when he was acting and he wasn't directing he came in just like everybody else did everything the same way yeah. and hung out with the guys did everything and then when he came in to direct that day tracksuit 
bring, you know, he's got the uh, the little the thing on his piece so he can look in and see the the whole thing. And yeah, and everybody had a crowd around to watch Clint Eastwood do his his direction on Oh shit, I bet. Great Escape. It was funny too because he talked about Clint. I love Clint. I, I one of the things I love what you're doing right now is the the westerns. Mm-hmm. So you know, yeah, I was, was going to ask you about. Western. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the. Uh, Death Magnificent, is that still going to come out or is it a... Magnificent Death is... Shattered Hands? Yeah, it's called A Magnificent Death from a Shattered Hand, which is a title that I didn't come up with. A guy named Jose Prendes wrote the original draft. I optioned it from him and and turned it into the movie that I want to make. We are right now going to finally go into production on that next year. Oh, that's exciting. And it's only because Westerns are now experiencing a comeback. You know, yeah. when I had this out in 2012, I had Nick Nolte and Jeremy Irons. I that's was right. talking to both of them. I was hanging out with Nick and we were riding horses with Terry, who was one of the legendary stunt guys. And he had a ranch and me and Nick would meet up there and ride and tell stories and and have a couple of drinks. And it was just a blast, you know, it was, yeah. and, and Nick had never done a Western, a real true Western. He did a couple of things with Walter Hill, right. where he, you know, played the sheriff, you know, and, and, and it was Western ish. Beautiful, by the way, I'm not going to remember the name of that movie right now, but it's <laughs> the Walter Hill film with Nolte where he plays the sheriff. And there's so many great Western sequences in there, but it's not a Western. And yeah. it's, this was be a real Western for Nick. And he was the perfect age. Now he's too old. This was back in 2012. It was yeah. It was a real sad uh, day when we, when we realized that we couldn't make the movie because nobody wanted to make a fucking Western. That sucks. But now, it, for whatever reason, you know, people come back around. And left and right. They just built a town in Montana, beautiful Western town. They they were building it when I was up there in October, shooting at the Marlboro Ranch, yeah. which is gorgeous, and that they had so much money. Their western town is a real town. The <laughs> bank is really a bank. The, the hotel is really a hotel. That's where I stayed. I stayed yeah. in the hotel. You walk outside and you're on a western street and ready to shoot. It was that's cool. It was gorgeous. It was a great experience. Me and Sam were the great DP. That's called the Last Sun. Yeah. Out. Hopefully, you know this. Soon, hopefully, we're lucky. It looks cool. That's it. Was really fun. It's going to be a really gorgeous looking western. There's a lot of snow and stuff. Reminds me of the Great Silence with Klaus Kinski and beautiful spaghetti western they made back in the day. Oh yeah, I know. Uh, I love spaghetti westerns. And now it's called Murder at Immigrant Gulch, (laughs) and it's going to be me and Gabriel Byrne and a couple other cool guys. Oh cool. Uh, And they built this fucking town. It's got it's a Y shaped town, so it's three streets in the shape of a Y, and yeah, every. Every block is looks like a different town. Yeah. So you're shooting in this thing, but you can, but you're, it's actually three different sort of little cities that we can, that we yeah. can travel to and from. <laughs> and it's the first movie that's going to be Three days right there. <laughs> they, they put a lot of money into this fucking thing. That's awesome. You like and, doing uh, Westerns? And I, I, I'll do them as long as they let me do them. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, everything's got its little phase. I was pretty convinced the Western was dead for good. Yeah. You know, but, but, uh, Unforgiven is really the last great Western in my opinion. So the proposition was pretty cool. But You, you have know, a favorite uh, Eastwood Western? Unforgiven. Unforgiven? Mine's Hang Em High. And I loved the outlaw Josie Wales. Oh, but awesome. what's the one where he rides into town and he paints hell? You is know, that, that's he, not on a pale horse. That's not pale rider, is it? Oh, no, he's the ghost. He plays the guy who's dead and, and he comes back and haunts these guys and makes them pay. And you, you know, of course, you find out at the end that he was the ghost of the High Plains guy. Drifter. High Plains Drifter. That's my favorite Eastwood movie. No, that's awesome. That's a great one. I think mine is high, is hang him high. I just love that's that. That's a great one. Yeah, that's early on. Scene. Yeah, that opening scene is and yeah. it's, it's the first one he did where. He got a ton of money. Mm. He did the production company. Mm. He got the money to get it to get it going. And it was after the spaghetti westerns. And it was just he kind of brought that's, that. That's whole right. Thing. That was yeah. the first sort of American western after the spaghettis. And the spaghettis live in a class by themselves. They're yeah. genius, absolute genius. Leone, yeah. Leone is uh, you know we we would be a poor race without uh, Sergio Leone. Well, 
Tom, I'm, I'm not even going to bother doing this long introduction because I think anybody who's watching this knows who you are, knows Wait, that what you're about. Skip all that stuff. Yeah. And I know I, I've watched a couple of interviews with you and I love the fact that you said you don't really care about the red carpet stuff. You don't get the fucking interviews. You're like, you don't understand why people want to watch them. And I love that because it was like just full on, full honesty. <laughs> you don't get that all the time. So mm -hmm. I'll just tell you right from the start, man, you, you be as you just be you. And well, don't worry yeah, about it. We try not to get in trouble. We won't talk about anything. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll just uh, stay away we'll, from we'll, we'll stay away from the politics because that'll I don't want to get trouble. <laughs> okay, and I could go on about it, you know that, but what what you know? Let's just call it communism, and and then change the subject. There you go. <laughs> Good. So I'm excited. You got a, a comic book coming out called Lycan. This is not your first foray into comics. And I don't think some people might not realize that you're a big comic book fan. I am and I have been since I was about eight years old. You know, I got in and I, and I wasn't a Marvel guy. I don't know, I've told this story before, but I got into uh, pre-code horror and uh, science fiction and war yeah. and uh, pretty story. much everything that, that the comic could be underground comics, you know, uh, all the fabulous furry freak brothers and yeah, corn fed comics. One of my favorites. There's only two issues. If you can dig up a corn fed, uh, you'll be in for a real surprise. And uh, just outlandishly bizarre stories that you can do in a graphic form, yeah. you know, that you, that you can't, that you can't do anywhere else. And it, that's a fact. Black hole, uh, yep anything by Burns, you know, all the stuff that really takes advantage of what the medium is, is I'm a fan of, you know, and, and I'll show you here, Let's see if you can see this. Yeah. Can you, can you see that? That's Black Cat. Oh it's yeah, that is awesome. Look at that cover. Wow. Uh, that awesome. the how's the reflection? It's all right. Yeah. I can't really see, but, but these yeah. are my, these are my, how about this one? Can you? Oh yeah. Starling Comics. That's awesome. Uh, that's Alex Schomburg. Oh, yeah, dude. Schomburg is one of the great. He did those covers in a kind of an airbrush style. Yeah. Well, I love it. Which no longer exists. I don't think there's one original airbrush Schomburg in existence. He's got some black and white interior stuff, pen and ink you can find. But yeah. But the Schomburgs, you know, they're that brilliant. And after they went to the printer, they just went into the dumpster. Oh, that's, that's a crime. That's a <laughs> It is a crime. I mean, you pay over a million bucks for something like that if you could ever dig one up. Oh, my God. Could you imagine? So I'm a fan of the art. I'm a fan of the storytelling and started my own company called Raw Studios uh, back in the day. We did a few books. We made a, one of my ones I'm really proud of is Dark Country that I directed the film. Yeah. The, the first dramatic film in 3D for Sony because they had these. 3D televisions coming out. They figured they might need some content. <laughs> so they let me direct this damn movie in 3D, which nobody had done. So I found a, but we knew that it could be done because yeah. it did go. And the new red cameras, we were one of the first guys to use the new reds. And I took it to an entertaining entertainment company that made uh, amusement park ride 3D footage for amusement park rides. Oh, cool. And they were able to build us 3D cameras, and we invented the whole damn process. That's crazy. We just had to make it up as we went along. We were editing for literally a year <laughs> because we were trying to figure out how the hell you, you do. To, so wait, we got two cameras, so there, and we had to match frame by frame and sync up these and stuff that you, you can do now with a computer program we had to yeah. do it all by hand basically had a blast and then i made the graphic novel and i got thomas ott who was um, a huge thomas ott ott fan yeah him up if anybody's interested he does this black and white almost looks like woodcuts and he did the graphic novel for us and we were able and i i, I, I did my director's cut they made me put 10 minutes back in the film because i didn't know this but they're like wait a second you know I, I wanted to make the old b film noir that was 75 minutes long yeah which they used to be the b the b picture on the double feature was you know anywhere from 65 to 80 minutes long and Mine was 75 minutes and they're like, dude, you can't do that. We've, we've got a minimum, you know, when we sell our DVDs to Germany, they want a movie and the, sh <laughs> the shortest you can get away with is 85. <laughs> so I had to put 10 minutes back in the film, which I took out 
when they brought me in to every director gets an opportunity to look at the when they start taking out swear words and stuff uh-huh, uh-huh. very nobody shows up i showed up and they're you know down at what are you doing here <laughs> down in the sony lot and there's these big buildings and little doors and there's just tons of little doors and every door's got a little number and i found my little map and i found one of those doors and i knocked on it and it's the size of a broom closet oh my god and there's a little guy in there and he's like who are you <laughs> my I'm, I'm you know per my contract here to do to supervise you taking out the swear word and what we did was i i convinced him to and he was a great guy uh, to take out 10 minutes of the film yeah and give me a cut so that's how i got my director's cut uh, of the film. And then a few years ago, a great guy named Eric Curland, <laughs> who runs the 3D museum here in LA, went through my director's cut and converted it to 3D. Oh, interesting. This was right before, this was 2019, before the pandemic. We got the downtown independent theater, you're blurry. We got the downtown independent theater to run it. Yeah. So I got to invite a bunch of 3D geeks and comic book That's geeks. Awesome. And we had a night where we screened the director's cut in 3D. That's awesome. That was really fun. And, and it was right before I was going to go off and direct uh, The Expanse. So I got some folks who were involved with that to come down and see my work. And and you know what? It's pretty good. The director's cut, I was so much more proud of it than, than I thought I would be. You know, I was like, yeah, yeah. you know, OK, I, I can do this. Did you? When you're when you're writing your comic books and you're working on them, and I mean you you've had some heavy hitters, Stephen Stephen Niles. I mean that guy. Niles was guy, great. Yeah, Thirty Days a Night is what Steve's famous for, and and a whole bunch of really fun. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. Kyle McDonald was sort of like a monster hunter, and we had that batting around. Lionsgate was interested in a few other places, New Line, but we could never get a script out of Steve. Uh, <laughs> we of course wanted to. Classic comic book writers, man. Yeah. Does it feel like? But when you're working on those and you're you're putting it together, the script comes together. You're working with the artist and all that. Does it kind of give you that directing style feel to it? When you're working on a comic book, it's exactly why I started the company. I always loved directing and wanted to get into it and wanted to learn, you know, what it was about. And I figured one of the great ways to do it is to write and produce my own comic book, which means that you're everything from the story that you're going to tell to getting a script that you like to hiring the artist who's going to bring to life in the visual style that you believe is. So it's casting, casting every part to the colorist and what kind of colors. So it's very much directing it to down, right down to the paper that you yep. choose to print on, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And, size, and then the covers and all of it. So yes, I and and you're working on a daily basis with artists, right? And you're communicating your vision to them, and you're also allowing them the freedom to bring why you hired them to the part, right? Yeah, yeah. So so that kind of control and then and then freedom. Right. That balance between control and freedom that you're allowing because you're it's a collaborative process. Yeah. Comic books are collaborative. It's not writing a novel. Right. right? It's a collaborative process, just like film. So they're very much inform one another. And I highly recommend it for the experience. It taught me so much about That's working awesome. with, uh, with artists and the technical side of of things as well i'm working on two books right now that we're trying to write up and, and, and get out there sometime it's, it's a, a lot of fun. love you're not going to make any money at it that's, that's right sure. that's right i don't make any money doing anything except for my day job <laughs> you know and i try to quit that one all the time <laughs> yeah. you gotta have something that you're passionate about and that wakes you, know. you up in the morning and that you feel is worth you know the sacrifice that you make to to you know to have a roof over your head and to eat and stuff like that the basic exactly. process. but as long as you have something that you're passionate about you know as a young actor i was like i, I you know working all i can't tell you the number of different jobs i did but yeah every day i made a commitment to myself early on you know that no matter how busy i was busy i would do one thing every day for the thing that i loved and yeah. whether that was just typing up my resume or getting my picture taken, you know, yep. or reading a play, 
right. that, I want, that I wanted to sitting down and going to Samuel French and getting my $4 copy of True West and sitting down and reading it. You know, that it one, one thing every day. Yeah, that's good. There are no days off and shit that you love to do. That's right. That's right. Why have, would you? We Why? Have I'm going to take a day off from this shit that I love to do <laughs> and do something I really don't want to do. Why would you do that? <laughs> we got this podcast and and then we're turning into like a YouTube thing and we do all this and we've been lucky to have these people come on. But it's this it's true, though. I work on it every day because I love it. I yeah. love doing this. It's a, it's a good creative outlet. Yeah. And then yeah. working with on, on this these comic books is a, it's a good creative outlet. And ta- are you going to self-publish or what's your plan? Yeah, we'll just sell. Yeah, I'll self-publish. I don't have, you know. Like if it, I'm hoping the first one that I'm working on, I'm on. Yeah. I just I got through Act One. I'm working on Act Two Great. right now. Perfect. You're, then, you're a comic book uh, fan. You know the structure yep. and the yep. and everything you want like to do. I love writing comics because you're describing the panel. Yeah. You know, you're writing the dialogue and the action, but you're basically taking a snapshot and saying, "What is the best snapshot to tell this story in a series of snapshots?" Yeah, that I can, that I can you know, uh, get as much information across in the most simple way and dynamic way in a way that tells the story visually. Yeah. You know, like the old Marvel style, just let the artist draw a bunch of shit and we'll write it after. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. going on. <laughs> brilliant, you know. And Kirby, Jesus Christ. That guy was awesome. Oh. The hands of Kirby, that's what I always think of. I can always tell a Kirby just from the hands. Oh, man, the hands, so gorgeous. And just his bold, black, uh, thick inks mixed with the delicate. You, I, I was, had the good fortune to go to an exhibit of all Kirby originals oh my at, God. A, at a small uh, gallery. Okay, just uh, invite me next time you go, because that sounds years wonderful. Years ago, and I don't know how they put it together, but it was all Kirby. Oh my God. And, and it was all framed and it was the original art. So it's oversized and it's on the wall and you can stare at it as long as you want. And I spent hours in there. I mean, just absorbing. And when you have it all together all at once, you know, you start to it's get, it gets deeper, you know, you start yeah. to sort of see into the mind a little bit and the, and how he sort of sees the world and the, and the people around him—it's just—it was—it's a really strong experience. He—he he was I a one. Think it's an underrated art form. He, oh, I—I I think it's high art. I really do, and it deserves. There's certain things that have gone into the, into the uh, what do they call the the canon? <laughs> yeah, and the, well, no, when the government takes some of the art because it's part, of, they feel that it's part of American. Oh sure. Culture yeah, and like Steve Ditko's original Spider-Man stuff. Yeah, is all part of the, the library. Right. Library of Congress, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and I think more needs to be there. I think places that showcase Monet and Picasso and all that, there's sure. no reason that Kirby and like my favorite artist of all time was Bernie Wrightson. And, and oh, well, I used to know Bernie. Bernie did, did you really? Cover, Bernie did covers for us. He did one for Bad Planet. Oh. He also designed the, which I have the original around here somewhere, but for my movie Dark Country, I had to, I had to have this kind of, corpse-ish kind of guy yeah uh, who'd been in a horrible accident and he designed it for me oh that's awesome so so we got the all the makeup artists and and the guys who do all that's the molding amazing. and all that special effects we we all ran off of, of bernie Wrightson original art that he'd drawn just god i got that around here somewhere but Did bernie you- was a dear friend he was a great guy he had a va- he had a stu- art for years his studio was in the valley in studio city and and you walked in and it was it was everything that you were hoping that it would be, you know, it was right, right. With little miniature skeletons and skulls and jars full of two headed babies, and, you know, and books, books and books and books and art all over and crowded and, cr- you know, and his little desk lamp. And he's in the middle of this surrounded by by Wrightson, you know, right. right. I, uh, I've got some photographs of that studio around somewhere. Yeah, so oh, much. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. You know, it all gets lost in the <laughs> sands of time. But uh, <laughs> that was a great experience with Bernie. Oh man, Bernie, great so man. good. Bernie and Liz are just, you know, we we had so many great times together. So many dinners and so many conventions and so many stories. Yeah, know, 
That's all awesome, the greats that would stop by to say hi to Bernie and pay their respects. He's he's up there. You know, Dar- I was buddies with Darabont for a long time, and he had yeah. almost the whole Frankenstein original art he was collecting. Oh, my God. He had a bunch. He had most of them. Wow. And so that was really fun because every time I'd go over, I'd be like, let's, let's break out the, the Frankenstein. Yeah. You yeah. Know, that, uh, that's like, I, I, I don't know if it's, I think a lot of people consider that his pinnacle right his oh mat- that's his yeah that's that that really and he knew it too while he was doing it you know that's yeah. why he did it it took him so long he's like this is going to be the, the let's see what i can do yeah let so- me push myself and see how good i can be and and that's exactly what frankenstein was yeah i love that i, I loved all his swamp thing covers the- really oh you know, god i love all the stuff he, i love the stuff he did for twisted tales which yeah. was, was sort of the ec takeoff by pc comics in the 80s they had twisted tales and alien worlds all written yep. by bruce jones another guy who used to stay here when he'd come into town i'd give him my <laughs> house here here right here and i remember i'd go into the premiere of true blood and you know which Ugh, but, you know, HBO turned me down in The Walking Dead. I brought Frank the Walking yeah, that's Dead to HBO. Terrible. And they said, you know, we don't want to become the Monster Channel because we got this vampire thing. Anyway, I went to the premiere and they handed out these glass bottles of True Blood. Yeah. So, and it, but they were glass. Yeah. They, they were the original run, and I put them in the fridge, and they were there for years. <laughs> and. I come over, Bruce Jones is staying with me. He's fucking got a bottle of True Blood. It's open. It's halfway. And he's like, this stuff was really awful. I go, Bert, I, Bruce, fuck, man. Look at this. I got three bottle, original glass bottles of True Blood. You just drank half of one. What are you doing? Those are years old, by the way. Years they've been in there. He's like, oh, no wonder they suck. <laughs> I mean, you know he's like why didn't you tell me How, what's there to tell you open a fridge there's three beautiful bottles of true blood I'm gonna drink <laughs> it, I'm gonna drink it. <laughs> bruce was great oh great that's book. hilarious twisted tales and alien worlds were just some of my stuff. favorite stuff really influential as a kid anyway bernie drew one of the best covers of twisted tales yeah there's a guy running through the woods. You can't see his face. And there's three kids in the background and he's running away from camera, but it's, it chops off. And, but around his neck is a, is a rope, right? And around yeah. and a rope, he's got strung heads of, of kids, these kids heads, and he's running with an ax and these three kids are running away by in the distance. It's a brilliant cover. That's one I'd like to have the original art for actually. I always thought that Bernie story of Captain Stern Captain Stern, wow, brilliant, right? Everybody. Yeah, right. I just thought it would be a, a such a fun live action movie to do something similar. Uh, to that. <laughs> you'd have to get the right. I guess you could do it now with digital. And shit. You could do it now with the digital. Yeah. And you had the right director and the right people involved. Oh, yeah. It would be pretty amazing. Yeah, that tone is really hard to hit. You know, that, that's probably why that hasn't been done. Is because that's a very tough tone to to nail. It's kind of close to uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, I think that uh-huh. James yeah. was doing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That would be a, that might be a person that might be able to pull that off. What else you got? You've had a busy 2020, dude. I was like looking you up and I was like, holy shit. I didn't realize you had all Thank these God. movies you coming. Know, got, got me out of the fucking house. And I'm grateful for that. Very grateful. Hunter's Moon. I'm going to watch that like tonight. No, I would. I wouldn't. No. <laughs> you know, I got I love a couple it. On Hunter, Hunter's Moon, you know, when they were shooting it. Um, yeah. You know, they do these little stories in Variety or whatever, Hollywood Reporter. And they so they, they called me. They're like, well, you're working on this. And I go, look, uh, what's it like? How's it? How's it? How's the set? And I go, it's yeah. a little bit like if Ed Wood decided to make the werewolf movie. Nice. And I went out there and I got in all kinds of trouble with distributors calling. Yeah. Me, How are we going to sell this movie now? <laughs> you know, look, I, I that was a couple of years ago. It wasn't that wasn't 2020. It hasn't listed as 2020 as a release in IMDb. It might have came out in 2020. We shot it in 2018 or 19 or something. Yeah. How was The Vanished? That one looked pretty interesting. That movie I did with Anne Hayes, fantastic actor. And we, we, you know, we worked on Hung Together for a long time. And I... That was a great show. The Vanished was a fun script, you know? It was, yeah. 
written in a funny style, but the story was like, this is cool, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, frankly, as an actor, like Duval says, one for the art, one for the condo. Yep. So this was one for the condo, but it, you try to make the best out of what you got, you know, yeah. and that's the fun of it. And also the challenge and all that. And they had an actress in mind and I said, no, 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 no. Whoever's going to pull this off needs to be smart. You know, yeah. somebody is really needs to be able to dig in and figure out what this movie is. Cause there's a, there's a deep twist in the film. Yeah. And, and in order to pull off that off, we were essentially having to act in two different films at the same time. No. And that was a challenge, which That's made crazy. it really fun. So you've got the reality that you're presenting to the world. Yeah. And then, but then they, this couple has their own reality. Right. Very different. Okay. And they're in trouble. And, you know, they get into deeper trouble. Their kid is missing. They bring the cops get involved. And, and, and there's another couple there. They're at this campground and the kids vanished. So, so, but we're having to navigate two different stories without tipping our hand either way to what story is really true. Yeah. So that it was really fun to figure out, you know, yeah. and, I, and I knew I needed a smart actor to be able to do it with me. And she figured it out. She, she's, she's a very bright girl. That's cool. Um, so I we have. had a blast, you know, and then, it, and then it did 195 million people seen it on Netflix. Holy shit. 195 million. That is crazy. have watched The Vanished. What do you think of all these streaming stuff? Now with the, the the simultaneous, like well, right now with this whole pandemic, they're all stuck at home, I suppose. Yeah. You know, but but hey, that's pretty good. It was it's uh it's up it's up there in the top five. It's actually number four of all time Netflix movies. That's crazy. News number one is like five hundred million people, like a half a billion people, four hundred <laughs> million people watched whatever that number one movie is. I forget. Isn't that nuts? So to be number four is pretty cool for a little movie we shot in Alabama in the mud. That is really cool. Got shut down three times by different unions, you know, while we're trying to make this, really cobbling this thing together. And, yeah. And, and but but uh, to to everybody's credit, the movie turned out pretty good. Well, man, I was gonna when I was gonna introduce when I was going to do an introduction, I was gonna introduce you as the most hung man in Hollywood. Oh, great! Because. <laughs> But I figured, man, maybe not. <laughs> How many times have we heard that? Exactly. That's that, what I started that was thinking. the problem with Hung. I tried to get him to change a fucking title. Yeah. So many times, you know. Well, I got to tell you something, though, man. That, that show was really funny. I thought your performance was great. I was going through a divorce at that time. Uh, yeah. And that show really hit home. So was I, by the way. Yeah, and I was watching it. I was laughing. It, it just kind of took me out of that reality for that little bit. So that, so that was great. Oh, it was great writing. It was really fun. It went off the rails when it stopped being a love story. Yeah. You know, it's a story about a guy who'd do anything to get his girl back. There was high right. school sweethearts. She was a cheerleader. He was a baseball star of this high school. And they had kind of had it all. And then they kind of lost it all. You know, they had a couple of kids. They got married. And then shit went south. Yep. But so here's a guy who's going to do, you know, his one talent is he's got a really big dick. Right. And, and so he's like, well, I'll use it. And, and, and but it's all to get his wife, his ex back. You know, right. once we lost sight of that, the show was over. Yeah. Yeah. That's too bad. But it was it was a fun ride and no pun intended, but it was it was a good show. And yeah, it was fun. I was naked on that more than I was at home. <laughs> uh, after a while, you're just walking around naked, drinking your coffee at craft service all the time. Uh, the crew is all there. They're, they've seen my dick so many times. Like, you know, that no nobody even bats an eye anymore. It's just that it got really did get surreal, you know. Yeah. And then all the women that were coming in, they'd be nervous because it's they're they're they they just here for the episode. Sometimes right. just the one scene. Right. They got to get naked. So a lot of my job was trying to make the women feel as comfortable. comfortable. Yeah. As, as they possibly as we could possibly get, you know, to 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 just to just to, to help her out you know when is that, it when is a sex scene a nude scene appropriate in a movie well i'd say anytime after the credits <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I think it's weird because sometimes I watch movies and I'm not opposed to any of that. You know what I mean? No, it's just great. If, when it becomes gratuitous, it yeah. just becomes, you know, it just takes you out of the story. So it's got to be with uh, True Blood. You got to be able to weave it in in a way that that feels uh, right for the story. We're not very good at sex scenes. Americans yeah. are, you know, incredibly prudish. You know, having been able to travel through, through my the grace of traveling the world through my job, I am exposed to all kinds of different cultures and people and attitudes. And yeah, yeah. we are incredibly like we're almost neurotic. We are neurotic. We're neurotically right. prudish. super repressed. <laughs> it's got, and, it, and it happened it just that's the way that we're grown up we're brought up into a yeah. prudent society which turns us into automatic prudes which means that if you're not then you're a whore a slut right a ladies man a, right. you know and it, the list goes on and really you're a human being who likes to fuck right and and I haven't met any human beings that didn't like to fuck. I'm, Either have I. And they're out there, and God bless them. <laughs> but they're rare. That's right. I like to think of certain people that they don't want to do that. <laughs> the porn industry is a great example. You know, it's this hidden thing, and yet it's, you know, it's like almost as big as video games, okay? I mean. The porn industry is weird because, like, the online presence of porn has changed your internet security, the way credit card processing is done. Well, they pioneered all that yeah. stuff. They're pioneering uh, VR. You know, yeah. it, all, it all starts with porn. Weird. <laughs> ridiculous. Okay. But again, let's not get into anything that, that is going to make me say stuff that I'm going to regret. <laughs> so like in those coming out, on Aftershock with, who was your writing partner on that? It's uh... So I started a new production company called Renegade with my yeah. partner, Courtney Lauren Penn. And we've been yeah. at it for a year and we've already got three movies in the can. One's a great vampire thing called Slayers. Nice. Which I did with a director, Asher Lev Levin. Asher Levin and I and my daughter are leaving on Tuesday to go back to New Mexico to shoot a film with Emil Hirsch and where Asher is going to direct us again. And, and my kid who's, who has earned her chops by going to school and she's been at it for years. She's yeah. she just turned 18 and this is going to be her first starring role. And I'm so Grace. fucking excited to act with her. I yeah. said, you gotta get this part. You know, I mean, I, she, you know, it's, it's you gotta nail this. great for you, but you got to do it. So we auditioned her. Yeah, and she she knocked it out of the park. I was like, oh, my God, I've created a fucking monster. Oh, that's she's an awesome. actor. She's a real actor. And yeah. Your mom's an actor. I'm an actor. So it's not surprising, makes sense. but but it is surprising. I was like, holy shit, you you got that thing like you're a good actor. So that's really fun. And I look forward to 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 getting on the boards with her, as they as they say. When did uh, when did you have the idea to really start? create your own production companies like Renegade, like Raw Studios. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it started with Raw. Look, I've, I've always been interested in the creative side of the process. You know, my old acting coach, Penny Allen, who's a genius, I worked with Sean Penn and Harvey Keitel and Pacino, and the list goes on and on. She taught me for until she died a couple of years ago. She got the cancer. Yeah. Um, but she, she was my mentor for 20 plus years 25 years i started out in my 20s you know and and she was well, somehow got this woman's number and she was a true genius she was just one of those brilliant women and, and she would always say you know your problem is you're looking at the big picture when you need to focus on your part you know yeah and i, and I was like yeah but that's where the hit my head just always goes to the story itself and 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 all of those possibilities and and then of course oh yeah and, and then there's the part that i'm playing so <laughs> i've always had that it's just where my passion lies you know yeah. sort of fun. you know i love the great harrison ford quote great to me not to anybody else is he goes you know they're talking about acting is i'm not a, a consider myself an actor i consider myself a storyteller uh -huh. i'm a storyteller yeah, and it's, that's always stuck with me. You know, stories are the most integral part of any society. They're what makes a society cohesive. Yeah, 
stories that we tell each other, you know, and, and, and those stories create the society that we live in, literally. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the importance of storytelling op- is obvious with, you know, movies and books and comic books and music and all the other ways that, that we tell stories. We are constantly telling stories to each other, ballet, opera, it goes on and on. And, and then there's new forms of storytelling that are, that are emerging. Now. Yeah. Uh, and being a part of that is my passion, you know, uh, uh, painting, there's, there's a story. Yeah. Uh, it's, and so we started Raw Studios with the ex- intent for me to learn how to tell stories, you know, and, and learn the ropes. And I wrote a lot, most of Bad Planet, which was our first book that I partnered with Steve Niles on and yeah. Niles was instrumental in teaching me the ropes, you know, but he was busy doing a hundred other things. Yeah. So I did most of the writing and the writing's not very good. You know, I read, I read, I read it a couple of years ago. I started rereading some of it. And I was like, God, this is embarrassing. <laughs> what was I thinking? Art is great. Yeah. The art's fantastic. And the, and the story itself is really, really cool. Yeah. A great movie, but uh, <laughs> dialogue and just the way that I put it together, <laughs> I was just starting out, you know, I was just yeah. learning the ropes and, and that's how you do it. You know, so that led to Renegade and Renegade is just a natural extension of Courtney and my relationship as uh, we were working together on a script. And then that evolved into, hey, you know, we we, we have a lot of the same sensibility. We, yeah. we, we, we complement each other. I've got skills you don't have. You've got skills that I don't have. Yeah. And together we can, let's see what we can do. So we started Renegade, you know, and it, and it starts right away. It's like, okay, we need a logo. Okay. So then you're now working with artists and you're collaborating and you're coming up with ideas and processing. And Some of the, most of the fun right there. And the logo that we created, it, it, we're both proud of, and yeah. happy with, and it, and and that's where it starts, you know. And, and then you're on to the okay, what movies are we going to do? And then there's the business side of how we're going to get some attention. We optioned the Stephen King book from a Buick Eight, and we're we're still in the process of uh, putting that together. But so what it did was get us a little bit of attention, and then people start bringing us stuff, and then we start picking and choosing what we want to do and how we want to do it, and how do you create, you know, not just a production company that's just going to shoot any old thing, but right. point of view. Right. You know, uh, what is Renegade? You know, and, and how do we create a mission statement? So, and all that has been extremely fun and fruitful. You know, we've got, I, I don't, we've got a TV show based on a best selling book called Crimson Lake. Cool. The show itself is going to be called Tropo. It's a detective thing. We're going to shoot it in Australia. And we just got one of the major streamers to buy it. Oh, that's um, awesome. So we're very excited about being a part of that process. And then we've got the Western that we're doing here in Montana. And I'm running off to do this thriller with Emil Hirsch. That's through Renegade. So we're really um, uh, having a blast and, 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 and learning a lot on, yeah. the, on the fly. When you run a production company like that and you're, and you got a lot of, you got a lot of, you know, a lot of sticks in that fire. You got to, you got to have a lot, you know, and as we all know, you got to have 10 projects to get one off the ground. (laughs) Right. To get one actually be seen. How do you choose what you want to do though? I mean, cause that's like, how do you, you're, you're you're looking at all these scripts and how do you look at one script and say, I like this, but I don't like that. Once you really get into the weeds, you'll find that there are not a lot of great scripts out there. Script writing is the hardest job in the business. Writing a good script is almost a miracle, <laughs> although there are some people who are better at it than others. And, and, and so, but it is a serious art form and it's finding a good one, first of all, and then choosing how, what you want to say, your mission statement, you know, yeah. so our idea is always to try to find stuff that is a little left to center and that breaks some sort of uh, boundary or convention or you know just kind of goes left when when everybody else is going right and there's a number of different ways to do that yeah Uh, uh, but but that's sort of the criteria and genre right now seems to be something that we're both really attracted to whether that's a western or a 
a thriller. You know, I'd love to find a good horror movie, but those are, I think, the hardest to find. Boy, there are so many ones that do well. I I thought Nicolas Cage's Mandy did was a great horror flick that that was super different than things you haven't seen in a long time. I'll have to check that out. I haven't Mandy. Yeah, it's called Mandy. It's weird. The whole thing is like it's 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 a lot of red, <laughs> uh-huh. a lot of red lighting. And it's just, uh-huh. it's super weird. It's well, that's uh, cool. I like super weird. Yeah. One of he, the greatest shows I've seen is also one of the weirdest. It's called dark. The German show on Netflix. Oh dark. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was good. I mean, brilliant. Yeah. I, I watched the whole thing. There's three seasons and it tells a complete story, which is great. Yeah. I watched the whole thing twice, you know, first of all, cause I'm dumb and I had to, fi- I could, you know, it was hard to follow all the characters. I'm right there with you. <laughs> and they play, they play, you know, there's the same characters, young, middle-aged and old, and they all right. interweave. So I, I'm going to watch this again, but it was a joy to watch it again. Yeah. I, I liked yeah. it better the second time. I, I thought that show, that show is my favorite. If anybody hasn't seen Dark, you're Go you check it out. kind of twisty, time travel drama. It's very much a drama. It, it's, it's gorgeous cinematography, beautiful direction, wonderful yeah. All the, it's just got it all so tom are you doing any are you planning on being more directing behind the camera or do you or do you still want to be in front of that camera as well yeah i mean i my, my interests are leaning towards get behind the camera more and more yeah you know, you know he's you get he's been doing it for a certain amount of time and i actually have something to offer you know yeah I have to give i have i have some skills and i've picked up some shit along the way. a lot of experience yeah there's only one way to get that. And, you know, I, I can implement it. You know, yeah. I, I, I did that with the expanse. So I directed episode three and had the time of my life. You know, I really did. I, I think it might be, it might've been my favorite experience. You know, not only was I working with a family that I'd known in this yeah. was the fifth, fifth season it's crazy uh, and everybody tried to come back to that show it was one of those shows that co- the cohesiveness came together in a way that, was, is special yeah that yeah all the time so people would drop whatever job that they were on to come in on that show when we when we would reboot every year so we had the family behind me and and we had a you know the cast that that i'd worked with over the years so all of that uh, you know as you come in as a director on television you're a hired gun you're there you have you know, a couple of weeks of prep, you shoot for a week and then you have a, you edit for a week and you're out. Yeah. So it's, uh, I got to go in a couple of minutes, take, okay. the, take the cat to the, no worries. To the vet because we got to get her a little health. <laughs> I understand that. Hey, uh, uh, last qu- fly by herself. Last I mean, question. <laughs> last question for you. Actually two questions, if you don't mind, and uh-huh. then get you out of there. One is what was your parents' reaction when you said, I'm going to be an actor. This is what I want to do. This is my passion. This is what I love. Were they standing no, behind you? They, they thought I was crazy and they were right. I mean, you know, it's a million to one shot, you know, run off to do what? Hard work. Fun. It, it's a hard life. Yeah. Know? And it was. And I saw a lot of people drop out. You know, as a young kid, you see a lot of people. If you had a second job, consider acting to be your first job, even though yeah. you're not being paid, you're going out on auditions and you're doing the best you can with what you got and you're looking for that break and but you're also managing the restaurant yeah you're gonna end up managing a restaurant and i saw that time and time again so yeah. you, anybody with a plan b is exactly what they ended up doing so i made sure to never have a plan b <laughs> I never had a plan b and that was hard, you know, laying in yeah. bed at night. I had those nights where it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm awake and I'm staring at the ceiling and I'm going, what am I doing? Yeah. What the fuck? Do I really want to be do? here. What is there's, there's no end to this tunnel. Right. You know, you're in the dark and that you have no, there's no way in, there's no way out. You're, you're there's no steady money. Hey? No, no steady money. Last thing, Ralph Tobacco, the great luck charm of, Barry Levinson was That's a mentor right. to you. That's right. What about Tabakin? Tabakin. What did I say? Tabakin? Tabakin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. A tobacconist. He probably would have killed me saying that. What did he think of your career when back when you really started going? Because you, you landed in The Thin Red Line, which is a great movie uh-huh. by yeah. Terrence Malick. And then Yeah, sure. I did Deep uh, Blue and all that. He was there for those things. What what was his last 
What you know? What kind of advice did he give well, you? I life? hadn't talked to in years, but I, I managed somehow at some point before he died. He he was in California. Yeah, and somehow we got in touch through a friend of a friend or somehow. And I was able to meet Ralph for dinner and tell him Good. the stories, you know, and kind of catch him up on my years. And, and that was gratifying for him. Ralph is a dyed in the wool actor. He's, he did, you know, he started on uh, vaude, in vaudeville. Ralph was an old guy in the 1980s when he was training me. Yeah. He was a real old school kind of guy. I, I had this kind of shuffly teenage walk. I was 16. When I started with Ralph and, and he had a rope on the wall and it had two loops in it and he put it on a nail and I came in once and I go, you know, and, and there it is. I get up on stage and he goes, you take that rope and you put one loop around one foot and the other around the other. And when you do your scene, you wear that fucking rope and I'll teach you how to walk on stage. Oh, wow. He was, uh, old school but you know what he taught me how to walk on stage you know because your body you know you, you your body's your instrument and i was kind of a shuffly had my hair in my eyes and <laughs> and i was shuffling around at my the boots the heels on my boots had worn down on the corners so much because i'd shuffle yeah when i walked and then he's like you know, knock all that shit off <laughs> and, and that's how he did it you know with a rope uh, hanging from a nail ralph was one of the one of the great mentors in my life I tell you a lot of stories but i won't <laughs> <laughs> all right tom well thank you so much i know you gotta go you gotta get that cat to the vet i appreciate your time man i'm i'm shocked yeah, that you came on fun. yeah anytime yeah, and, and, uh, I, and the like it, uh, I with aftershock. So look out for the it's a renegade aftershock co-production joe pruitt and I are, are going to be the creative uh, directors on this thing. And we're really excited. We're looking for an artist right now. So anybody out there knows anybody who can do Bernie Wrightson, get in touch, you know, info at rawstudios.com. I will tell a guy named Blackie. Yeah. An amazing artist. And uh, you should look up Blackie Pumpkinhead. And I think you'll see okay. that oh, this is guy. The Pumpkinhead stuff? Yeah. Yeah, that's a little right. It's a little bit cartoony for what yep. I'm going for. I'm going for a much sort of my Franklin Booth kind of style. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm going for something a little more mature. I yeah. like I like the pumpkin head stuff, and he does have a little rights and esque. Yep, yep. Uh, it looks really cool. good. But anybody yeah. out there who's uh, got an idea, please uh, get get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, man. All right. Well, you have a good time, and we'll right talk now. soon.